Welcome inside with the insiders. Tom Pellicero, Mike Garofolo, Ian Rapport. There is a ton to get to around the league. But just real quick off the top, can we just reflect for a second here, Mike, starting with you, on the fact that we're going into week 17. We got two weeks left in the regular season. I feel like it was yesterday we were zipping around in inside training camp, and now suddenly you start seeing that, that Super Bowl ticker they send out every morning being a day in the 40s here. I don't know. Maybe it's the fact that we're, you know, in this semi-post-COVID world, we're actually traveling like normal, but I feel like this has flown by. Yeah, there's a clip of Mike Francesa uh, spliced together um, by, was it Funhouse? Is that the account where it says Mike Francesa is constantly surprised how quickly the NFL season is going? It's just like, we're in week five. Can't believe it. Week eight. Can't believe it. And just ever since that, I'm, I can't, I, like, every time you bring, I can't say that because I'm afraid of, like, we're going to be spliced together one day and made fun of on the internet. We probably will be spliced together and made fun of on the internet, but for probably other reasons than that. Um, this is always really weird to me because we get to this time of year. It feels like the season's been going for 95 years. These next two weeks go by excruciatingly slow, and then January goes by in the blink of an eye because we got coaching stuff and then playoffs, which is awesome. The NFL calendar is weird. Our lives are weird. Anyway, what do you want to talk about? There's, there's plenty here. Let's start with some of the quarterback issues around the NFL, including one in Miami that I'm sure we'll be talking about here for the foreseeable future. It is Tua Tungavailoa landing back in concussion protocol. There is going to be plenty of both professional and amateur doctoring uh, on the Internet and reading into videos and everything else. Let's just start in the facts here with Tua Tungavailoa. What we know is he finished out that game on Sunday, according to the team, he did not report nor exhibit any signs of a concussion. Dr. Alan Sills, the NFL's chief medical officer, joined NFL Network's Judy Batista earlier today and said the same thing, which is that, yes, Tua hit his head, which happens many, many times in any every NFL game, but unless he then exhibits symptoms of a concussion after the head impact, it's not enough to trigger the protocol. But Tua shows up on Monday morning. He is exhibiting symptoms. This would be, honestly, a pretty standard part of the NFL, except that Tua suffered one of the scariest concussions that we've ever seen back in week four in Cincinnati, missed several games. It led to that, or the combination of issues, led to changes in the concussion protocol here. It raises a whole lot of questions, Mike, about not just the concussion protocol, but also uh, Tua's short, medium, and long-term future. And quite frankly, I'm not sure that any of them are answerable right now by the three of us sitting there. Well, and they've been clear, Dr. Alan Sills and, and uh, all the medical experts have been clear. It's an inexact science. It's very subjective. The way that you determine how a guy has a concussion is based on uh, symptoms that you can observe or he can report, which Tua did in this case, uh, or answers to the questions as you're going through the protocol. And there, there were no indications that anything popped up on Sunday during the game. Uh, so it, it, you can't sit there and, and just observe from afar and say, oh, this guy is conclusively, objectively, he has a concussion. So did he play poorly? Yes. Apparently he wasn't playing through symptoms because he reported them after the game, which can happen. You can have, I mean, it was, it was a giant, just happened last week or two weeks ago. Jihad Ward was giving a post-game interview passionately talking about how the team needs to step up. And then two days later, it was in the concussion protocol. So it, it can happen. Uh, as far as his future and, uh, you know, the, the, the medical experts and, and Dr. Sills uh, made it clear that they will uh, gather all the information as they take him through the protocol, present it to him. He will have a say in the matter. In other words, if he says, you know what, bag it, that's too many. I don't want to continue to suffer head injuries. I'm out. Like, it'll be up to him. But I, I just don't see a, a scenario right now. It doesn't seem where everybody's, anybody's going to throw up the stop sign right now and say, that's it, you're never coming back right now. The only person I think that is going to do that in this case, Ian, is going to be Tua himself if he decides to do it. I'm not saying he's considering it. I'm just saying that, that seems to be the only way that he doesn't return to the field ever again. You know, we're in such a weird time now with all of this, and I don't mind Twitter doctors. It's honestly kind of interesting to see the guys who share their expertise based on watching one you know, one angle or maybe sometimes two angles, and they say, oh, here's what this injury was. And that's always interesting because those guys know a lot of things, at least. And then there's the concussion Twitter doctors. And yesterday, to see immediately, you know, 
a video on Twitter where it's like, here's where he got a concussion. It's like, okay, well, did he? Or I don't know. Like, it anecdotally explains him playing terribly in the second half, but we don't know if that's real or not. But that was kind of the backdrop of all the discussion yesterday. It's like, oh, well, obviously that explains why he played terribly and why he threw it to the other team so many times. But we don't know if it does or, or doesn't. We don't know if he was feeling anything. We don't know if he just didn't say anything. We don't know if he was completely fine. I mean, that's that's the main problem. So, like, you know, I know you know you guys, just like I do, talk about injuries on TV all the time. With concussions, there's almost nothing to say because it's very cut and dry. He has a concussion or he doesn't, and there's really no gray area. Um, so it's just, this is all weird. I hope Tua is okay. Um, it's terrible timing for his team. Not that that matters as much as his health, but it is an absolutely critical stretch for the Dolphins. They're now going to probably have their backup quarterback this week because of this unfortunate situation for everyone. There was also a quote that Tua had during his post-game press conference referencing that on the second interception, he might have called the wrong play in the huddle, which some people want to point to and go, aha, from my understanding, that was Tua protecting a receiver who ran the wrong route on the play, so he's trying to do the leadership thing. And Mike McDaniel actually referenced that in his press conference as well. So this was not evidence that somehow Tua was unable to call the play in the huddle. Frankly, quarterbacks mess that stuff up sometimes too but in this case this was actually him just trying to to do a solid for one of his receivers I from what I understand unlikely and I think that's pretty apparent that he plays this week against the Patriots which means it'll be Teddy Bridgewater in a big time game for Miami also uh, I would fully anticipate Tua is going to do the same thing he did last time which is consulting additional concussion specialists gathering all the information here before making any types of decisions about exactly where things go from here let's get to a team that is getting their quarterback back in the lineup that is the New York Jets Mike White who took all those hellacious hits in the game against Buffalo missed a couple of games medically cleared Ian after three fractured ribs and to listen to Robert Sully even though he keeps saying they're not quitting on Zach Wilson seems abundantly clear that for the duration of the 2022 season however long that goes because they still have playoff hopes alive this is very much Mike White's team and it should be. And that's like, it's funny, like Salah has, you know, I, I think he's handled this the right way. I don't know how you're supposed to do any of this. You know, publicly distancing yourself from your franchise quarterback that you still believe in and you still like to be back next year, but definitely not this year, is a really tough dance for Robert Salah. I think he's done a nice job. But I don't know, guys, that I've ever seen a situation like this. First of all, everyone knew for sure that Mike White was going to get cleared Monday. I mean, everyone knew for sure, including fans, by the way. Um, and it's been, I'm not sure there's been a quarterback more universally celebrated than Mike White, who doesn't have a lot of credentials, doesn't have a big pedigree, came from being cut a couple different times, and now is basically the savior. Like, if they are going to the playoffs, which is still possible, he's going to have to lead them there. And if he does, it leads to many, 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 many more questions, including... Does he begin next season as the starter? Do they bring in someone like Jimmy Garoppolo? Or do they bring Zach Wilson back? Or do they try to trade him like the Cardinals did with Josh Rosen? Like, God forbid the Jets win. The questions are way more than if they lose. That said, I guess they will take it. <laughs> well, I, he could play himself into that. I, I, I think that's a big part of what we're watching down the stretch here because there's been some good performances. There's been some close games. There was that upset of the Bengals, uh, Mike White. Then there was the... Uh, uh, game against the Bears where he all of a sudden was pushing because the thought was like maybe he just looks great because he's the ball's coming out quick he makes quick decisions he's checking it down it was like no that's what defenses were giving him and then he started to push the ball down the field a little bit more and it was like oh, okay maybe he's got all of the tools to make it happen so I, I think these last couple of games here he can play himself into well at the very least we can bring in a veteran and Mike White can compete with that guy or if he doesn't play well, then it's like, hey, we need, we need a long-term solution or a permanent solution here at the quarterback position that isn't Mike yeah. White or isn't Zach Wilson. I, I don't see any way that he plays that poorly. So I think you could have yourself a, an interesting situation, maybe a la Washington, right, where Taylor Heineke played really well, but it was like, look, we got to go out and get somebody. So they bring in Carson Wentz, and the next thing you know, yeah. Wentz kind of gets hurt, and, and Heineke's back in the starting role, and now it's likely going back to Wentz again. Right? You could have one of those type situations with the Jets. We'll see. But uh, to me, you've got Mike White, at the very least, a terrific number two, a good guy to push whoever you've got in front of him, and, and maybe even have that competition 
going in, even if you think it's going to wind up being the other guy. Yeah. Really quick, Ian, because we're going long here. Zach Wilson's got $9.3 million fully guaranteed over the next two years. as a fifth-year option that could be picked up after that. If the Jets try to trade him, what can they get? Uh, you're probably – I don't think it's going to be the Josh Rosen deal, which was a late two. I think it'll no. probably be more no. like – no chance, right? I think it'll be more like, you know, fourth or fifth rounder for someone to take a flyer, and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. And I don't think he's going to give up any guaranteed money. Why would he? So my guess is fourth or fifth rounder, maybe a little bit later. But I do think he's tradable because all quarterbacks are tradable. In other quarterback injury news, Jalen Hurts still day by day, according to Nick Sirianni, which means what, Mike, for this weekend and their game against the Saints? Means he's going to push to play, and they may have to pull back on the reins a little bit. But you know Jalen Hurts, you know he hated sitting the other day, number one. But to sit out another game, you know, for right. MVP purposes, also competitive reasons, right? Let's let's close this thing out. Now, what it really means to me, and I we, we sat here when the injury came news came out last week, and I said to you, here's a scenario that interests me. What if... It gets to week 18. The Giants need that game against them, and they go, you know what? Jalen Hurts hasn't played in week 16 or 17. We got to get him some action. So if he doesn't play this week, I think in week 18, yeah, he gets some action with the starters. Now, look, they're starting to get a little banged up, okay? Avante Maddox goes down. Lane Johnson's dealing with something. Uh, you know, and, and maybe you, you pull back and say, look, we don't love the idea that he's going to have a month plus off if that's the case, but we really need to err on the side of caution. Who knows? We'll, we'll see what happens. But I, I expect that Jalen Hurts is going to push to play this week, but he just may not get to that point where he, he'll be able to do it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm with you, Mike. I, I do think he tries to play. Like, if he went out there and practiced this week, I wouldn't be that surprised. No, nothing wrong with that. Probably help him keep sharp a little bit. The only thing I would say is the thing I always say, which is literally nothing is as important as being healthy in the playoffs. Like, not seating, not buys, not home field advantage. Literally nothing. Putting your quarterback in harm's way for seeding, to me, I'm sorry, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I don't know. What do I know? Real quick, too, on the Giants here. What they have to do, it's very simple. Beat the Colts this week, and they are in. Hard to imagine, based on the Colts team that we have seen, particularly in the second halves, the fourth quarters <laughs> you recently. never know. They're going to beat anyone. My but God, that's Nick the Foles. hurdle the Giants Negative have fantasy to points, Tom. Negative get fantasy points. You net week, week to week in the yeah, NFL. Watching you, you sending us know. your lineup last night. <laughs> Ian, Ian sitting there at halftime last night with minus six on Nick Foles in his championship <laughs> game, where all he had to do was not start him at all. It wouldn't have been close, and it was getting uh, a little close for comfort. But he escaped. Oh I escaped because Justin Herbert didn't far outscore Keenan Allen. We got plenty to talk about. We'll talk a little fantasy later on in the show. Let's take a quick break here. We got to get to J.J. Watt announcing his retirement and also yeah. big changes in Denver where Nathaniel Hackett out as the head coach. Where do they go from here to fix Russell Wilson, who they do believe is fixable? We'll talk about all that next from the inside. My first year covering the entire NFL at USA Today at the time was back in 2013. For whatever reason that year, I remember having quite a few uh, Houston Texans games and seeing J.J. They were Watt good. dominate like, <laughs> I, I would fairly say almost, yeah, they, they were good. But I, I would fairly say dominate unlike virtually anybody that we've seen on defense during the 12 years that J.J. Watt's been in the league. You look back, I did this earlier today, from 2012 to 2015, four seasons, J.J. Watt had 69 sacks, including two years with 20 sacks, won the Defensive Player of the Year three times over those four years. He ended up playing seven more seasons. He was hurt during four of them. The injuries really kind of added up over the course of his career, but was playing some pretty good football before making the announcement on Twitter today that he is walking away, played his final home game this past week. He'll finish out the season over these next couple of weeks. The way that they could move him up and down the line, Mike, use him in different positions, create those mismatches, and just his innate ability. Look at all these highlights. Getting the hands on the ball all the time. I, I, there's just not another defensive end we've seen with that much ball production, to say nothing of the fact that he was a pass rusher. And you know, just in terms of the body type, I, I don't know that we've ever seen anybody else quite like this guy. Yeah, he had a pick six, or was it a fumble recovery for a touchdown, whatever it was, and he had a, 
Uh, took a picture afterward. His entire thigh was black and blue uh, from an injury that he had suffered, and he was <laughs> yeah. playing through and running through. Yeah. Um, pretty impressive career. Uh, the thing about Watt was you, you started to hear last offseason because Amazon was coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. They had a bunch of seats to fill for their Thursday night football coverage to start from scratch. There were some other networks that had some moving parts, some empty chairs that needed to be filled. And all of a sudden, J.J. Watt was being discussed at – uh, discussed uh, for a potential broadcast career. That's interesting. And it was like, well, he still got, I think it was like $8.5 million fully guaranteed, something like that. And he still had uh, the desire to play one more season. He loved the fact that his son was there for his, for, for his last home game, even though the son won't remember. He's just a little baby. But it was nice to have that experience. So it sounded like he just had one more season in him because he could have just jumped ship and taken one of those broadcast jobs, I would expect. In the near to long term future, JJ Watt to have a successful career in broadcasting uh, in some capacity. So, uh, kudos to him uh, for his playing career and, and best of luck on what's to come. I am sure we have not seen the last of JJ Watt connected to the NFL. I kind of wonder, and I'm not a TV agent, obviously, I have a full time job. I kind of wonder if he'll be like Strahan. Where, like, it's football a little bit, but also, like, mainstream. Like, he's got to be as much mainstream sure. a football player as, as we've seen, right? And I think he'd be, I don't know, he probably would be great at whatever he does. A couple interesting things for me on J.J. Watt. One, I was watching the Cardinals-Bucks game at Mike's house the other day. Mike, thanks for the bourbon. I appreciate it. Um, mm -hmm. J.J. is still awesome. He really is still awesome. Like, I haven't, I mean, I've watched a lot of Cardinals games this year, but I haven't really sit and watched just only that like I did. He was in on basically every play. He is retiring at the top of his game, which is pretty amazing. Like kind of like what you guys were saying though, like I think back to his early Texans career when the Texans took him early in the first round, everybody probably thought they were crazy. And then the playoff game, which I think was his rookie year, but might have been his second year, he had the pick six and took over the city. And I'm like, this guy is amazing. And the legend started building where he had that rustic you know, log cabin in the woods, which turned out to be a 16,000-foot mansion. But it just, it all escalated from there. J.J. Watt is amazing. He deserves a nice <laughs> retirement. I'm happy he got one. The 2011 NFL Draft in the top 11 picks, Cam Newton, Vaughn Miller, A.J. Green, Patrick Peterson, Julio Jones, Alden Smith, Tyron Smith, J.J. Watt on top of Marcel Darius and a couple of quarterbacks that I won't mention in here. But that's, you got an MVP You've got like four surefire Hall of Famers and probably three other potential Hall of Famers. And then, Crazy. you know, the Titans took Jake Locker. But it's, it's one of the best tops of the drafts uh, that you'll ever see even before you got to Watt at number 11. Also, I was just looking this up. In 2014, J.J. Watt, this is just, these are like Chuck Norris facts. Five touchdowns he scored in the 2014 season. He had an interception return, a fumble cut recovery return, and three receiving touchdowns that season because they were using him as like a detached Gronk style tight end. I mean, we just we haven't seen anybody else quite like that guy. So kudos to JJ Watt on a incredible career. And as I mentioned earlier today on NFL Now, since we're now all hardened to the reality that sometimes guys announce they're retiring and then a few months later, after we've all given our tributes, they come back. JJ Watt would be a free agent after this season so if at any point he gets the itch he'd come back sign with any team he wants that would potentially include the denver broncos who would are going to have a new head coach after they fired nathaniel hackett on monday it seemed guys like an increasing inevitability that hackett was going to be out the surprise if any was the fact that it came with two weeks left in the season but greg penner the new owner and ceo made this clear today that they were embarrassed on sunday it was a family affair for the the Walton and Penner family, obviously, out there with uh, Stan Kroenke and his family as they took on the Rams, giving up 51 points, fighting on the sideline, fighting on the field. I just step away and think it's amazing that Nathaniel Hackett kept that team together as long as he did because there were a lot of challenges, a lot of dynamics, obviously, all the injuries that they dealt with, and the fact that his quarterback, you know, right or wrong, was playing poorly through the course of that season. Obviously, the idea was it was going to be Hackett plus Russell Wilson. That was going to be this new era of Broncos football. It did not work out that way. They are still committed to Russell Wilson, who is fully guaranteed on his contract through 2024. What do they do now? George Payton said today, you know, this is not about changing coaches, it's not about fixing Russ, but do we believe he's fixable? Yes, we do believe that he is fixable. 
Ian, who is it or what should they be looking for at a time that you're not just trying to fix Russell Wilson, the player, but also the entire really culture yeah. within that building, which, you know, this year was not where it needed to be. I can't believe what a disaster this was. And I will say this. I mean, from the first week, it looked like a disaster, and it was. And I will also say, Tom, that I think you, uh, in private comments, I don't, I don't feel bad about sharing this, you expressed concern really early on that the coaching staff was so young. Could have used some guidance. Could have used some veterans. Someone to help him kind of get this thing going in the right direction. Uh, real quick, because I know we got to get to break. To me, offense, defense, it doesn't matter. Hire a leader who will come in and get the culture right and make sure Russ is doing what he needs to do, make sure the receivers aren't throwing fits every time they don't get the ball, make sure guys aren't fighting on the sidelines. You could find a good offensive coordinator, but, God, get this culture right for the first time in a while. Yeah. I hate to say this because Russ pushed against this in Seattle for so long. Got to run the ball. Got to get somebody who's got a good mindset for running the football and allow him to play off of that. I know you spent all that money. I know he had grand designs of maybe I'll be an MVP candidate finally. Run the football. Sorry, Russ. Yep. Forget MVP candidate for the moment. Just get back to playing the type of winning football that you played in Seattle uh, for a long period of time. All right, we got to take a quick break yeah. here. I've got a fantasy scenario that actually happened to me. And, you know, I know no one cares about my fantasy team, but I do. This is an interesting one. We've got a great I debate here over a violation of rules in the playoffs and what the punishment should be. We'll talk about that after this on The Insiders. I'm in a salary cap keeper fantasy league, and this scenario arose this morning. We do all the bidding through an automatic process on a website, but someone manually keeps the salary cap numbers. Every owner is responsible for managing their own cap. And it turns out one of the semifinal winners this week bid $10 on Gardner Minshew, and according to the spreadsheet, that put them $8 over the cap for their semifinal game, which raises this question, which was debated in a lot of emails and a lot of text messages today. What should the punishment be for this violation? And keep in mind, Mike, the player involved won by 35 points. Minshew contributed 25 points to their total. Doesn't Up matter. until forfeit. Ooh, don't what care. would you say is the proportional punishment? A forfeit is that's it. It's a forfeit. You were in violation of roster building rules. That's it. You're done. Yeah, I, I don't see the problem here. You lost. Goodbye. Try again next season. Stay within the rules. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm with Mike. Absolute forfeit. I mean, should be lucky you don't kick him out of the league. Definitely dock draft picks next year. Inexcusable. There are rules. If you don't play by them, then you don't get to win. I don't, I don't see the argument. Goodbye. Am I embittered because I got knocked out of this league by like .08 points last week? Who's to say? But I'm definitely not in the championship game. He is for now. Updates on this as we sort this out tomorrow. Thanks for joining us here on The Insiders. For Mike Garofolo and Ian Rappaport, I'm Tom Pellicero. See you.